So that's coming. I'm not sure when. I'm definitely going to end chapter three before that comes, but uh, we may do it. But we'll do it when we do. So, anyhow, we are in Ephesians chapter three. And in some ways, we're spinning our wheels, but I'm doing it on purpose because I think the points, the three points that I've made the last two messages are extremely important about Paul having a high view of his ministry, a high view of his, in verse 7, a high view of his message in verses 8 to 10, and uh, a high view of his master, who is behind both of those, because it, the message is about the master and the ministry comes from the master. And so Paul Paul had a high view of all three, and I believe we should as well. And so I've decided to just kind of blow up and just be here for a little bit. Forgive me if you think it's a little too long, but that's what we're going to do again tonight. Speaking to expand the outline a little bit or just fill it out a little more would be a better way of putting it. Filling out the things that we're talking about that we've already dealt with in the first two messages. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being here. Direct our thoughts by your spirit in Jesus' name. Last week, we focused the microscope down on Paul's message. We really reviewed that point. He had a very high view, of, excuse me, on his ministry. I'm sorry. We focused on his ministry and what a ministry it was, a ministry whose results are still in the world today and remember greater than we, all the things we mentioned, it was greater than uh, and so forth. And so thankful for that. And so uh, tonight we're going to move on with his message and his master as we kind of review what we already said and build on what we said before. And so I hope as we go through this and think about this, uh, that God will bless us tonight. So let's look at what, what Paul says in verse who he's talking about his message now, his message. You know, there are a lot of Christians that if you ask them, what's the, what's the Christian gospel? What's the message? They could not give you a clear answer. They couldn't give you a clear answer. Paul had clarity as to the message God wanted him to give to others. And he had clarity and ability to express it. And he, and he says, if you've heard the, the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me toward you, he says, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it's now revealed to the holy prophets and apostles by the Spirit. And the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. The gospel is Paul's message, but the gospel is for all mankind. It's a message of God's grace. It's a message about God's grace from beginning to end. It takes grace to deliver that message and get it to the people who need it, and it takes an understanding of grace and an excitement and enthusiasm about grace to deliver that message. You and I and everyone else does not deserve to be saved. We don't deserve that any more than the demons. Why would God do what he did for us? And neither do you or I deserve to tell others about how to be saved. Sometimes I'm amazed at that, that God would take sinners to tell other sinners about the gospel. It's only because of God's grace that this message can be heard, believed, uh, and 
it's only by God's grace that this message can be proclaimed. And the God, book of Ephesians is all about God's grace. And there are many people that sing Amazing Grace but couldn't tell you a biblical definition or a biblical grasp of the gospel of grace. Do we know about God's grace? Are we overwhelmed by the subject of God's grace? That people like us can be saved. That people like us can proclaim it to others. Paul was. You know, the Apostle Paul's writing this kind of close to the end of his life. This is around 60 AD. He'd spent almost 30 years proclaiming the gospel of grace. He accomplished a lot through Paul proclaiming that message. Think of the ministry that he had in his three missionary journeys. The churches that were planted the people whose lives were changed. Uh, Think of churches that we know about from the New Testament, the book of Acts, the Galatian churches, for instance. We don't even know how many there were. All camped out in the province of Galatia. Galatia is not a city, it's a region. And that was a cluster of churches. Or how about the more famous ones, the church at Corinth? fairly good-sized city. But Paul also preached in smaller places like Philippi or Thessalonica. The Ephesus. That was one of God's greatest works through Paul, planning in a church in a place that was that dark and that satanically controlled, and it became a hub for other churches in Asia. But when Paul's writing this as an older man, he has what some of us would say is a diminished ministry. I'm not planting churches now. There's no going about, going into synagogues or claiming the gospel or preaching in Jerusalem to thousands and thousands and thousands of people that want to kill him and yet heard the gospel. He's in a prison. He has limited human contact with people outside. A few people coming and going. And that has gone on for almost four years. And Paul will get out of it for a little bit and be able to do a little more ministry, and then he'll be locked up for the last time and executed So Paul, at the end of his life, for the most part, had a diminished ministry. It wasn't an ever-creasing ministry as far as church planting and numbers of people listening to him. But even when it was going down, God was using him to write what we call the prison epistles. And then later on, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and Titus. That's a large part of the New Testament, isn't it? And so God was using him in that time of what we would humanly say, boy, not much is going on in Paul's life now. Do we really know when God's working the most? Is it when a whole lot of people are coming to church? Is it when a whole lot of people are coming to Bible class? Is it when a very few people are coming to Bible class? Which one? I've taught Bible classes mostly my whole life. And I found out I don't know when God's working the most. And, you know, if I if I look back over the Bible classes that I've had, I've had many classes, 40, 50 people. That's small for some people's ministry. But that's pretty big for mine. And our one, one class got up to 70 for a while. But one of the one of the classes that I think God was working more in than any of the others, and maybe I'll find out when I'm in heaven that that's not true, but it was a class I had at Stalker, which was the old girl's dormitory 
and it just turned into stalker. Amy was born during that. And the highest number in that class was eight. And mostly five. But an mm -hmm. awful lot of those people went into the Lord, went on for the Lord and served the Lord. But as far as fruitfulness, that might have been my biggest fruitfulness, bigger than the classes with greater numbers. So who knows about God's math? Who understands when God's working and when God's not working? We look at people too much. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thrilled if God uses us to reach a lot of people and we should want to reach the masses, we want to reach the crowds and just be happy when that happens. I certainly was when I preached to hundreds of people in grade school and high schools in Africa. That was fun. Boy, that, was, that, that crowd will set a preacher going. You want to ignite a preacher? Put a crowd in front of them. It, there's something about it. It just it moves you to reach people. But the Apostle Paul's ministry has been rather diminished for quite a while when he writes this epistle up from a human perspective. But he's still excited about the gospel of grace. And if he can't proclaim it verbally, he's going to write about it in this epistle. He can't keep quiet about it. He's got to do something to declare it. My favorite story, you've heard me use it many times, is D.L. Moody when he was studying about God's grace up in a, up in a room. Uh, 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 got so excited about God's grace, he went downstairs went out on the street and grabbed the first man he said, he was a great big guy, grabbed the first man he said, and he said, do you know about God's grace? <laughs> I mean, there's a guy who was enthused. I'm not recommending we do that, but he was overcome with it. And the apostle Paul was overwhelmed with God's grace. That people like us could be saved, that people like us could minister the word of God, there's no higher privilege on this planet than that. None. There's no bigger job than that. There's nothing more important than that. And the Church of Jesus Christ is not a holy club to ford up until the trumpet sounds, be comfortable and be safe till Jesus comes. We, we are on a rescue mission. And we ought to be amazed that we are saved. We have a passion that other people will be saved. And the sovereignty of God is meant, and boy, Ephesians is big on that, not to hamper evangelism, but to stimulate evangelism. Uh, and uh, it certainly did it for Paul, and it should do it for us. And so what a precious thought as we come through here. It's a remarkable fact, someone wrote this, I didn't check them out, but it's a, it was in a fairly scholarly book, so I think they probably forgot the figures right. It's a remarkable fact that out of the 155 times the Greek word charis, or grace, occurs in the New Testament, Paul is responsible for over 100 of them. He really was, he loved to talk about grace. Why wouldn't you? You're killing Christians and God saves you. That would really imprint upon you and God was gracious to you personally. Remember, he said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. He was deeply, deeply thankful for God's grace to him personally in saving him that the chief of sinners, as he put himself, could be saved. And when he talks about the past life of other Christians in their depravity and demonic control, he includes himself, Titus 3.3, 3, Ephesians 2.3. He doesn't, he doesn't exclude himself from that. He includes himself in the group that were desperately lost. So all the apostles preached the gospel of grace. They all had the same message. That's pretty easy to document, uh, not only from what Paul says here in verse um, 5, but also from Acts 15, 6 to 11, 
where Peter says, we will we'll be saved even as, by the grace of God, we'll be saved even as they. What in a conclusion to that first council that the apostle Peter agreed with Paul. But the 12 apostles focused primarily, at least initially, on Jewish evangelism, and Paul had the privilege of focusing on Gentile evangelism. Paul was up, and initially he didn't see that. He didn't like that. He kept trying to do Jewish evangelism. And he kept trying to convince Jesus that I'm well qualified for Jewish evangelism. Acts 22, 17. They know what I was, and they know who I am, and they'll be they'll 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 hear if if I tell them that Jesus really is risen. And he was arguing with Jesus, and he says, "No, I'm going to send you to the Gentile, far away from here to the Gentile." And that was our Lord's plan from the beginning in Acts nine fifteen and sixteen. Paul would go to the Gentiles first and foremost, but the Jews also. He had a Jewish ministry. So we don't always get to go where we want to go, to who we want to go to, but God puts us just where we need to be. And Paul understood that there was grace upon grace upon grace for himself, and that there was grace upon grace upon grace for the city of Ephesus, that anybody ought to be saved out of that hell hole of a demonic culture, where they yelled for hours, great as Diana the, of the Ephesians, and almost started a riot, uh, and were under tremendous demonic domination and deception, and the demons that were there, and everything else that was going on in that city. Whenever there's idolatry and false religion, there's great demonic activity. And of that group, Paul writes to them about their salvation. Remember in chapter 1, the praise of the glory of his grace. You were saved because God's gracious, or God would just left you go to the praise of the glory of his grace. Do you remember that in chapter 1, verse 3? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, through which he's made us accepted in the Beloved. And he says to the praise of his glory three times, and the first two times he talks about his grace. It's all grace. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, in which abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, in which he's purchased in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in whom, it's in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted Christ. Paul got all excited about God's grace. He got all excited about the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in chapter 1. It was all for the praise of God's glory and a display of God's grace. And then he goes in chapter 2 and describes all the satanic <coughs> domination that they were involved in in those first 10 verses, and he includes himself, and such was, and, 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 how's he put it in uh, chapter 2, verse 3, among whom, 2-3, three, three, among, among whom also we all had our manner of life. I was controlled by Satan just as much as you were, even though I never worshipped uh, Diana, the goddess I was. So Paul's message was the message of the gospel of grace. And he said, if, if an angel comes back, or if I come back and teach any other gospel, then now you've been taught the gospel of grace, let it be accursed. This is it. This is it. You got it. He was excited about it. On vacation, I took uh, James Grisham Machen with me. Uh, 
I took a little selective biography. I've read his bigger biography, but a little selective one, which was has been really enjoyable. And I finished that, and I took a a, vol a small volume of twenty sermons called uh, "God's Transcendent," God's Transcendence, and I've had that book for years, and I hadn't read all of it, so I decided to see how much more I could read on vacation. And Machen preaching on Romans six twenty three. In that book, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, said this, wrote this. No man is interested in a piece of good news unless he has consciousness of needing it. No man is interested in an offer of salvation unless he knows that there's something from which he needs to be saved. It's quite useless to ask a man to adopt the Christian view of the gospel unless he first has the Christian view of sin. But a man will never adopt the Christian view of sin if he considers merely the sin of the world and the sins of other people. This is a very insightful statement by Machen. Because we've got a world preoccupied by the sins of other people. All this crazy stuff that we're hearing by the politicians about the sins of other people that they did to other people long ago, and everybody feels very self-righteous about looking at our ancestors and their sin, and they're living ungodly. Machen said, but a man will never adopt the Christian view of sin if he considers merely the sin of the world or the sins of other people. Consideration of the sins of other people. This is Machen written. You know, he died, what, 1939? Sins of 37. The sins of other people, he said, consideration of the sins of other people is the deadliest of moral, of moral anodynes. It relieves the pain of conscience. It also destroys a moral life. Think about that. Where are we as a culture? We got people preaching. Be focused on the sins of the Christian white man a long time ago and everything they did. Nobody's looking at themselves. They don't think, oh, we're self-righteous. We got, we got a moral superiority. We wouldn't do what they did. And they feel real good about themselves. Boy, Satan blinds the minds of the lost. Thus the light, the glorious gospel should shine unto them. And one of the ways he does it is with religion, false philosophy, or false polit political views. He does it. Or churchianity. False Christianity. Modern Americans are awash in self-righteousness. They're self-righteous about everything. They're self-righteous about what they eat or don't eat, and other people, what they, they don't eat what they eat, and I don't, you know, they're self-righteous about everything. John MacArthur said, I just saw this on the internet, the preacher is not, the problem is not about some what somebody did to your ancestors. The problem is you. You know, Christ, Christians can get that way. Churchgoers, the problem's out there. The problem's out there. These non-church people, they're the sinners. And we, we're so proud of, sometimes of where we go and all that, but Looking at others never brings you to a, a good look at yourself, right? Because we all have a moat, a beam in our own eye, and, and we see the moat in a brother's eye, as Jesus said. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And what Paul is saying is everything around us pressures us to be ashamed of the gospel not to believe the gospel, not to share the gospel, not to promote the gospel, 
anything and everything is okay except that. That is not permitted. And listen, Paul's message of the gospel is to be our message today. We are to pass it on undiluted and disinfected. <laughs> disinfected by false Christianity and false ideas. Undiluted as it's passed on from the Word of God. And the Apostle Paul was in the front lines of the invisible war when he penned these words in verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel by which I was made a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. Grace for them to be saved and grace for me to preach that they can be saved. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, most Jews would think that was the most horrible assignment you could get to spend your life with Gentile people. They wanted to spend their life away from Gentile people. That's how self-righteous they were. When Paul caught the vision of God for a whole world, he thought, I get to be the one to kind of, yeah, Peter was the first, but I'm the one that really gets to break, go through this door. Um, that's a precious thought. You know, in the military, somebody blows the door open with a shotgun, and then somebody else goes in the door. <laughs> they know just where to shoot and what kind of load to use to bust that door open, and the next guy goes in. Paul was the guy that got to go in. Peter blew the door open when he went to preach to Cornelius. And the door to the Gentiles was open. God did it through Peter. But Paul got the Paul got to spend himself his life, his lifetime ministering there. I, I hope at Athens Bible Church we thank God for the privilege we've had as a church to minister to international students. Here we are living in Southeast Ohio. And God brought them here. Not that any everybody's important. Don't get me wrong. Everybody's important. Everybody comes through that door is important because you never know who God's going to use to reach how many people wherever. It's not that we try to rate people on importance, but I'm simply saying the very fact that they're going to go back to their country, just it's an exciting thing because they can spread it. And that's a good thing. And Paul's message is our message today. And Paul said, God forbid that I should not preach the gospel. He knew he needed to preach the gospel. He needed to pass it on. And he prayed for this church. Uh, uh, notice over in chapter 6, verse 19, when he ends the, as he's getting towards the end of the book, he says in verse 19, Praying, all, verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, watching thereunto perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. That's the same thing he's talking about in chapter 3, to which I'm an ambassador in bonds, that in this I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I'm not done preaching because I'm not in starting churches. I'm in prison. I'm still preaching. If you go to a hospital, preach. If you go, if you go to nursing home, preach. If you go, you know, if you're a shut-in, call somebody on the phone and talk to them or talk to the, all the people soliciting to you. You could do that. Dr. Whitcomb used to witness to everybody that would try to crank call him to buy something from him. Well, he has my deep respect. I, I usually yell at him. <laughs> but... He, I don't yell, but I just politely tell him what I think of him. <laughs> tell him to get a real job and get saved. I do do that, but I don't spend a lot of time at it. But, but he says, for which an ambassador in bonds, that in this I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And so Paul was all excited about the gospel and getting it out. 
And so he's telling the church to pray. He prayed for them. He wanted them to pray for him. A church that doesn't pray for its missionaries and its leaders is not meeting its biblical responsibility. Right? It's not if you feel like it, do it. If you want to do it once in a while, do it. The Apostle Paul was very clear about this. A church without prayer is is a church without power. And a church without out, outreach is a church that's going to be out of business. It's, it's our job to pray. It's our job to reach out. Paul did it. We're to do it. Is Paul's message our message? I hope so. Hey, what's I, I thought about this question last night. What's more important? Being a separated church that really teaches a lot of Bible or being a church that gets the gospel out? So here's a church that's really good on teaching, really good on Bible teaching. They're extremely good on that, but they don't witness too much. Hardly witness at all. And they're very separated. They don't compromise. And here's a church, they compromise, they hold hands with everybody they shouldn't. Boy, they get the gospel out. They're really good at witnessing. Which one? Well, the answer is, that's a false dichotomy. You understand what I'm saying? That's a false dichotomy. You can't play that off of one another. If a church is separated, they take a good stand, they're strong Bible teaching, but they don't outreach, they're going to be gone. They're just going to, sooner or later, they'll be out of business. They'll be in heaven. <laughs> they'll be gone. They had a holy huddle, and they were good at teaching, and they were ministering to each other, and but they're going to be gone. Well, you say, well, the church that witnesses and leads people to the Lord, they compromise. I mean, they hold hands with everybody. They don't have much discernment. They're much better, aren't they? Are they? If they compromise, they're going to be out of business. It'll take longer. It'll take longer, but sooner or later, a little leaven will leaven the whole lump, and they'll be out of business. So the dichotomy that came to my mind last night as I was thinking about this, I said, which one could be better? And the answer is, neither of those are good choices. The church isn't in a place to do either or. The church is to teach. Paul told the Ephesian elders, take heed to yourself and the whole church over which the Lord's made you overseers. And I'm free from the blood of all men because I haven't shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. You've got it all. I didn't just give you a little bit. That's part of it, the whole counsel of God, including ecclesiastical separation. But the other part's what? Witnessing. <laughs> you, you've got to reach out. You can't ignore the responsibility for evangelism personally, individually. This is quite important. I'm glad there's some people listening to me on YouTube. I hope more people listen on YouTube. I want that part to increase. That's a good thing for our church in, in some of these things. But that's not enough either. We got to talk to people individually, face to face, person to person, one on one. What a wonderful sacred secret, that mystery that was hidden in the heart of God all had. And he, he he loved it. He fell in love with it. He got he, he couldn't get away from it. It was his passion. Is Paul's message our message? And are we do have a passion to get the message of God's grace out? Like Moody did. Have you heard about grace? Is Paul's master our master? 
We talked about Paul just getting excited about Jesus Christ and he, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what he talks about a little bit down in here that we've hit before. Um, he, he, he's so excited about it in verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ? He is rich beyond imagination. He has more grace than any of us can imagine. If you were a doctor and you could heal everybody and you knew what would do it, it'd be exciting. When you'd have a hard time retiring. <laughs> you'd have a hard time quitting because you had something everybody needs. The message has to be right. Churches have to take a stand. If they don't, they'll be out of business just as much as those that take a stand and don't evangelize. But you've got to have the right message, right? A Mormon Jesus is not the Jesus that has unsearchable riches. That's a fake Jesus. That's not the real Jesus, the second person of the Godhead. The JW Jesus is not Paul's Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is not Paul's Jesus. The modernist liberal's Jesus is not Paul's Jesus. Those are figments of men's imagination. The health and wealth Jesus is not Paul's Jesus. Paul talked to the Corinthians uh, very strongly on this, didn't he? If somebody comes and preaches another Jesus, you bear with them. And who are these people that preach another Jesus? They're Satan's emissaries. Satan invents all kinds of other Jesuses, different Gospels. Turn to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see that. I know you know that. 2 Corinthians 11. The Jesus the Judaizers preach is not the Jesus had unsearchable riches of grace. Paul says, would to God that you should bear with me a little in my folly. Indeed, bear with me, for I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But the problem here is there's people going around posing as the real husband who aren't the real husband. And I fear Thus, by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his craftiness, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. For if he comes and preaches another Jesus whom you've not preached, we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which we've not received, or another gospel which you've not accepted, you might well bear with them. You're so tolerant over there. There's a tolerance that's promiscuity. There's a tolerance that's unfaithfulness. So the Apostle Paul exposes these people in verse 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing that his ministers be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Machen has a, another message that I read on vacation. I have wonderful study times on vacation. <laughs> uh, just reading something not to preach on, but I get excited about. And this is a message, gospel, the gospel and modern substitutes. And he's talking about Jesus teaching about hell. And he said, if you want... If you want terrible presentations of the wrath of God, don't turn to Cotton Mather or Jonathan Edwards or to Calvin or Augustine or to Paul, but rather to Jesus himself. Because Jesus said more things about hell than anybody. Do we believe the Jesus of the four Gospels? of the epistles? Do we believe his statements about sin and about Satan and about ourselves? Do we believe his statements about salvation? 
We believe in his work that we could be saved. Paul said, I get to preach the unsearchable riches of grace. People who aren't sinners don't need grace. But people who are sinners, in big sin, need a God who has more grace than they have sin. How many sins does Bill Hicks have? How big a mountain is that? I don't know. That mountain's still piling up, I suppose. But it's searchable. Sooner or later, people will say, well, that's Bill Hicks and Sin. There's the mountain over there. But Jesus has more grace than I've got sin. Jesus has got more grace than you got sin. Grace greater than all our sin is how the hymn puts it. Right? And in him and through him, you see, Paul had a master. Master had an unlimited, infinite amount of grace available, more than enough for Paul, more than enough for the world. But God has set parameters by which that grace is exercised, and God has set parameters by which that grace is received, and God has set parameters by which that grace is preached. We have no right to presume on any of these things. But we do have every right to preach it as the Apostle Paul did, to embrace it as many of the Ephesians did, um, Paul was overjoyed. Paul was overwhelmed. Paul was totally occupied, you might even say obsessed, with proclaiming God's grace. It was almost there's a relief if I can just get it out another time to another person. Doing what God wants me to do giving the most precious gift out that could ever be given. It totally occupied his life. Jesus was his master. He was Jesus' was servant. He introduces himself in Romans 1.1. 1, 1. And Paul spent the rest of his life saying, Jesus is all the world to me. And in this book, he calls him the chief cornerstone of the church. In this book, he calls him the bridegroom of the church. In this book of Ephesians, he calls him the very source of our spiritual powers. We can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And he ends the book of Ephesians with this verse. Will you turn with this in chapter 6, verse 24? He ends it this way. Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. One Bible says that love our Lord Jesus Christ with undying love. And I believe that Paul loved the Lord, don't you? And I believe that he expected every single one of those Ephesian Christians loved the Lord. And I think they did. Ephesians was written in 60 AD, but around 95 AD, John wrote the same church. And Jesus said, of that church that loved him, they loved him because Paul loved him. You see, the leaders of a church help to guide people where their affections and their focus should be, right? The leaders focus, 
and affections are usually the focus and affections of the people, How about the human leaders that teaching them and training them and living. Somehow, the, the, the whole church takes on certain amount of uh, emphasis from the leader's emphasis. Paul loved the Lord. He made no shame about it, and he loved grace. And they, so they loved the Lord. They were doctrinally strong, weren't they? Even 37 years later, they were still strong. They left their first love. That first love was for the Lord. It took 30 years, but somehow they left their first love. The Lord wasn't impressed with their doctrinal correctness. Doctrinal correctness without love for the Lord does not impress the Lord. It shouldn't impress us. I trust that our doctrinal statement will remain strong until Jesus comes. Talk about our love, about our passion. Paul had a passion. May God give us that same one. Thank you, Father, for the Apostle Paul as he talks about his ministry and his message and his master. Thank you for the enthusiasm of his life. He said, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. Who wrote things like, he loved me, and gave himself for me, who wrote, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified to me, and I to the world. Father, we thank you for a brief moment. As we move into the, pr the prayer that Paul prayed for these people, What a prayer it is. And help us, Father, because now we're really getting into serious need of serious need of self-examination as a church and as individuals. May our prayers be in magnify you and our prayers be large prayers of adoration and joy in you knowing who you are and knowing who we are in jesus name we pray lord as we go from this place loving you more trusting Oh.